This podcast is brought to you by Neuro Creative Studio, the number one provider of one to one applied neuroscience coaching and development programs designed to enhance your creativity and effectiveness. Find out more at neurocreative.studio. You're listening to the Ambition Incubator podcast, and I'm your host, Deirdre Morrison. My thing is helping people understand how our brains work so that we can be better and do better in any area of life that's important to us. So as well as bite-sized brain science, I'll be bringing you interviews and advice from experts and guests who specialize in working with entrepreneurs and leaders to help them explore potential, possibilities, and ways to be more effective. And the best bit? We can start right now. My guest today is a physician and veteran podcaster with a passion for neuroscience. Dr. Ginger Campbell has been podcasting on the topic of brain science for 15 years now and has created more than 200 episodes of her monthly show. We touch on several key topics, including the critical developments that she's seen over the years, why consciousness is such a hot potato, how scientific literacy levels impact our overall progress, and what she means when she says that she believes having a basic grasp of neuroscience is essential to being a citizen of the 21st century. To kick things off, I'd love to ask you, Ginger, is there, what was it that drew you to neuroscience and exploring more about the brain? I was fascinated about consciousness. I came to it after, oh, maybe 15 years of interest in Eastern philosophy and Buddhism in particular. And I had reached this point in my own journey where I was like, okay, people keep talking about all this ancient wisdom, but there's got to be a way to incorporate the new stuff we've discovered. And so for the first time in my life, I actually started reading Western philosophy. I'd always read Eastern. And I discovered that there was this branch of philosophy called philosophy of mind that intersects with neuroscience it's a fascinating thing about philosophy. It's like things are in philosophy when they can't quite be studied by science yet, right? And then they reach a point where now they can become science. Well, that's the way it is with the study of consciousness. Up until about 30 years ago, it was considered unapproachable by science. And so people who were interested in it, in it went into philosophy instead. People like Patricia Churchland, who's uh, wonderful person who's been on my show many times. And these people, they all went into philosophy because they couldn't study it scientifically. But now we have a whole generation of people who've grown up studying it. So that's what got me interested in it was consciousness, because that's what makes us human. Mm. And of course, even just to tease out this idea of what's meant by consciousness, you know, um, for some people, it will be just as as simple a, a definition as being awake and being alert or not, but there's there's a lot more to it than that, really, isn't there? Yeah. The day-to-day word is you're conscious if you're awake. In the context of science and philosophy, it means um, having subjective experience. That's mm. the simplest definition, the ability to have subjective experience. And that's why there's debate about whether all animals are conscious, because we can't necessarily tell whether they're having conscious experience or subjective experience. Although we've got evidence to go by now that causes scientists who study this to have certain ideas about which animals do and do not have consciousness. But still, we can't ask them. So some scientists claim we can't ever know because we can't ask them. But we can ask people. Right. And so there's people who say only people have consciousness because we're the only ones who can talk about it. I don't fall into that camp. I fall into the, if they've got a certain um, amount of brains, they probably are conscious. But mm. that, there's a big debate about that in the field. And even, I guess, the the, the problematic thing of thinking about consciousness, which is something we can't quite pin down, and using these very conscious tools that we have, like words and logic and all of those things, to actually nail this butterfly to a mm-hmm. to a piece of felt. It 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 
definitely seems like this could be going on for some time. What would you say are the um, the major steps forward that it has that, that have been made in the last 10, 20, 30 years? Well, the biggest one just is the fact that consciousness is now considered a reputable area of study, which as mm-hmm. I noted, it wasn't. The A turning point may have been the 1994 book by Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize winner, who wrote a book called, um, oh, all of a sudden my mind goes blank on the name of it. We'll find it and we'll put it in the notes. Anyway, um, but he proposed that that it was um, a product of the brain and therefore could be studied. And along along the around the same time, we started to have various neuroimaging techniques, you know, like functional MRI, mm-hmm. which allowed us to to a certain extent see what's going on in real time. And although I sort of think the role of fMRI tends to be exaggerated, especially in the field of psychology. It is true that it was a turning point in the sense that it made people think, oh, yeah, I can see it's happening in the brain. And that made them, you know, believe it, you might say. It's kind of sad to say that there was other good evidence that was kind of ignored until we had the imaging. But you know that's humans for you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, fMRI, if I'm if I'm thinking of the right thing, is where you get the sort of phrases like people say, "Oh, and there in this we see that this area of the brain lights up when such and such an activity mm-hmm, is going mm-hmm. on." Is that yeah, yeah? Mm. But the pro there's a lot of problems with it. I don't think we should focus on that today because we'd use up the entire interview time. But anyway, that's the big thing is that consciousness has become something that can be studied by science. And a side effect or unexpected thing from that is that we've learned that most of what our brain does is not conscious, Mm. which actually is not what the assumption was prior to that. I mean, back in the 1800s, there was a scientist who said, you know, thought that vision was being processed unconsciously. And he was poo-pooed because everybody assumed that perception was conscious. Now we Mm -hmm. take the fact that most of what goes on in vision is unconscious for granted because it's been well established. But there was a time when that was not what scientists thought, which is a very good introduction to a very important principle of science, which is it's not fixed in stone. It's not a set of facts. It's a process. Mm. It's a way of understanding the world, which means our understanding changes, mm-hmm. you know, as we learn new things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, we definitely have to be open to the fact that we may have been taught certain things ourselves over the years about, you know, how our emotions work, for instance, how we think about things. And they are now not as set in stone, as you say, as as we thought they were, as we were told they were. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, what are the things that you maybe personally have come across? What are the concepts that have really made changes and differences for you in the way you approach things? Well, it relates to this unconscious process in a way because... The way we experience the world is is basically created by our our brain. One of my guests, Michael Graziano, said that our brain gives us a stick figure account because <laughs> a lot of stuff gets thrown out that we don't need to, to know. And what this means is that my perception of the world and your perception of the world are going to, by definition, be different. Mm-hmm. And as a physician, I see this every day when I'm talking to patients and I realize, you know, they're not starting from the same place as I am and and trying to find that common place in the middle where we can, you know, they can understand by my getting closer to where they are. I would say that that is the biggest impact Mm -hmm. that it's had. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. it, Actually, just as you were talking, it reminded me of a conversation I had with a friend once he's very much into cars. <laughs> and <laughs> we were talking about the fact that 
you know, two cars after a certain amount of time, once they pass into being like classic cars, for instance, even if they come off the same assembly line on the same day, they will feel very different to drive after that length of time because of tolerance and variance. And I guess, you know, if we think about people, we don't even start at the same place because we have genetic differences and then we're born into cultural differences and there's so much going on. And even if you are genetic twins, that is true. Um, I have an episode coming up soon with William Harris um, about how the brain develops before birth. And there's a lot of stuff that happens so that even a twin, even twins are different. They may look a lot of like, but they they are different, you know, from the time the first two cells divide, they are unique and different. Mm, yeah, it is absolutely fascinating. One of the other questions that I wanted to ask you is, based on this absolutely beautiful line that you have in um, the back of your uh, your document, Five Things You Need to Know About Your Brain, and I just love it so much that I'm going to read it. And it said, <laughs> I believe that having a basic grasp of neuroscience is essential to being a citizen of the 21st century. I wonder, would you tell us a little bit more about why you put that line there and what it means to you? Okay. Um, I'll, I think I'd like to use an example. Mm. So one of the things that we've discovered is that our memory is, does not work the way most people assume it is. Uh, it's mm. every time you recall something, memory is dynamic. It's not a video playback. So every time you recall something, your brain inserts stuff that's happened or you've learned in the meantime. So if you have, say you have a sibling, if you ever talk about your childhood, it may be an event that was important to both of you. You suddenly discover that your memory of it is entirely different, right? Mm-hmm. So which one of you is right? Mm. Probably neither one. So, we have a lot of conflict in the world over things that people remember differently or somebody even, you know, somebody changing their story a little bit over time can be accused of lying. It's not necessarily lying. It's just the way the memory actually, the way memory actually works. So this is a good example of we can get all this conflict and accusations and all this stuff just because people think memory works one way when it really works differently. So Mm. that's the reason why I think it's one reason I think it's important. The other reason I think it's important is because if you don't have a good understanding of how things really work, you are a target for scam artists. I mean, probably the number one way of scamming people right now is to sell them all kinds of ridiculous, make your brain better products, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so you don't have any clue of which things are likely to even be valid if you don't know the basics. It's mm. like if you, you know, didn't have any basic science and you think a perpetual motion machine is possible, right? Then I could sell you one. Mm. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. scientific illiteracy has gotten so bad, at least in the United States, um, that this is a really big problem. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that that is uh, definitely one that um, I note with concern myself. You know, I I have seen quite a lot of things where people are maybe just going down these avenues and being told that if you if you do this one thing, that will you know solve X, Y, or Z. When in actual fact, because we're really dealing with an n equals one situation, that may or may not be the case. Yeah, and one of the things I try to do on my show, Brain Science, is not just share the science, but share how it's done and Mm -hmm. the fact that it's done by people, which Mm -hmm. means that, you know, scientists are human, they make mistakes, they have biases, all that's true. But it doesn't change the fact that science is the best method that humans have discovered for trying to get closer and closer to understanding the world in an accurate way. Notice that mm. I'm not using the word truth because, you know, probably that's not a, um, attainable. But we can come to something that we can all agree on if we agree on mm. what the rules are, which is, you know, have some evidence, have hypothesis that's testable. You're, if you believe, if, you, if you're going to say this is a scientific theory, it should predict something 
that then if, if you do a test and that doesn't happen, you should say, okay, I was wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what makes it different from other fields mm-hmm. where, you know, it's more about opinion. And everybody's yeah. opinion is equally valid. That's fine. But that's not the way science works. And unfortunately, the news media no longer seems to understand that. Yeah, I was actually just about to say it's it's amazing what um, can be extrapolated from a, a research paper or something and then blown out of all proportion, which suddenly becomes, you know, a firm belief for a, a section of the population. Um, and it's really, you know, something that remains to be tested or needs further work done or maybe has been supported by an organization that has a vested interest. And, you know, we, we just have to be very careful about what we believe in, in terms of what's presented to us. Yeah. And understanding that science change is also very important at, uh, at the practical public health level. Let's take, for example, at the beginning of COVID when some of the leading scientists said, well, don't wear a mask. Well, mm. you know, that was based on very limited knowledge at the very beginning. Mm. Yeah. So, of course, when it became clear that wearing a mask helped and they had to change the guidelines, people who didn't understand science got all mad and goes, oh, that just goes to show you that they're just manipulating us or they're just lying mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Whatever accusations that were made were based on not understanding how science works. Mm. And and it's true, there was probably a window of time in there where they didn't change the recommendations because they feared that people would do crazy things like go out and get all the masks and then doctors wouldn't have them. But that was a small window of time. Mostly Mm. it was just the transition between um, inadequate knowledge and learning that masks helped. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I suppose if we try and understand the perspective of the people who are feeling frustrated and worried and anxious about these things that, you know, these, these changes are, if when you're dealing with a very dynamic situation, it's to be expected and science is always going to be dynamic, isn't it? Yeah. But I mean, like I said, right now we are in a situation where most people don't really understand at, at all how science works. Mm. I mean, mm. I think it's a miracle that anyone goes into science after the way it's taught in school. <laughs> which is so boring, right? It's like it's a bunch of set, a, a bunch of facts that are set in stone, which isn't how it works at all. Mm. Um, instead of being, you know, about asking, you know, interesting questions and seeing if you can figure it out, and then once you've figured it out, you have more questions, and so it's a, it's a never ending, you know, for all this love of true crime, which I don't <laughs> share, you know. If people could see that that's the same level of curiosity that that scientists mm. have, and that's why I like to interview scientists so people can see that they're people, that they have passion, and that um you know it's it's not about a bunch of you know test tubes, yeah, and uh, you know even just some of the words that you're using there, you know curiosity and it's really about engagement and innovation. It's all very much higher states of consciousness that we're looking at in this um, and being tied to things where we're um, maybe feeling very rigid or black and white about them. That's going to be not exactly the state that you're going to be in as a, as a scientist doing the work, doing the true work out there. Right. But because scientists are human, they tend to, for example, get vested in their theories. That is mm. real. They're just like any other person. They don't like to admit when they're wrong. You know, all that is very real. It's not, it's not to say that, you know, scientists are better than anybody else. They just have a different set of skills. And just like you, hopefully, are going to go to your physician rather than to use Google as your source of medical advice, or at least use Google only as a complementary source. You know, that I think, I don't know, this has nothing to do with your show, but this whole let's be anti-experts. I mean, if you need a plumber, I mean, <laughs> are you going to call a plumber? Or are you going to say, oh, I'm not going to call a plumber because I I can do everything myself. Mm-hmm. Nobody can in in this complicated 21st century can do everything for themselves. Mm-hmm. 
Well, maybe somebody living out in the, you know, wilds of the Amazon can, but I can't. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that that goes for not just health, uh, but also our, our technology and remote controls and all of these things. Um, yeah, it, it, it moves very quickly. I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. So in terms of your podcast and your work, uh, Ginger, I, I know that there is an absolute mountain of information and really good and interesting topics that people can investigate more through what you've been doing because you're you're a, a long-term podcaster um hall of fame inductee for podcasting as far as i'm aware um what what's the what would be your favorite topics to talk about on that podcast if people were to go over there right now i like to talk about emotion because that's also one of the things that is very important to understanding how our brain makes us human, which is the main theme of my show is that neuroscience is helping us understand how our brain makes us human. Mm. So big topics that I talk about, I already mentioned consciousness, emotion, memory from time to time because that's relevant. There's one topic that I really love that will probably be new to most of your listeners. It's called embodied cognition. Mm. It's the idea that we are not a brain in a vat, that Mm -hmm. our body, our brain is in a body. Our mind is a product of our brain, our body, and our interaction with the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you familiar with Andy Clark? He's a British philosopher who has this idea of the extended mind, which in his view includes like, if you take notes in a notebook, you know, and you use that as a source of information. Of course, now everybody puts it in their phone, but same idea. Um, you know, for most people, their their smartphone is now mm. part of their extended mind. They can't hardly yeah. function without it. But anyway, the idea that we're embodied, that being embodied is very important, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to the sort of traditional cognitive science way of thinking of it, that our brain is like this computer and what its form and the fact that it's in a body is irrelevant. So Mm -hmm. being in a body is really, really important. And I um, have an episode, I'm about to do episode 200 soon, and it is actually going to be an episode where I have a couple of um, scientists talking about how this affects learning and how it should be affecting teaching. So mm-hmm. that's another good example of a very practical topic. And I've got a lot of feedback from that over the years. One of my listeners was a professional gymnast who just loved that topic. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so those are kind of some of the kind of main ones. And then just, you know, interesting topics like, you know, what things, one of the ongoing issues in neuroscience is, you know, how much do we start out with and how much do we learn? You know, what comes from culture? What comes from, you know, um, you might say the wiring? That's always an ongoing um, conversation with many different researchers. And um, so that's another big topic. Fantastic. Well, where do people go to listen to this podcast? Because I know I'll be there every day whilst I'm catching up on 200 episodes. (laughs) (laughs) Any anywhere you, where you listen to audio, all the podcasting apps, um, Pandora, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, all those places, it's everywhere. You can go to brainsciencepodcast.com. That's my website. So and people will be looking for they'll be looking for the Brain Science Podcast on whatever the favorite platform is. It's actually now called Brain Science without the word podcast in it, but You should see a blue sort of neuron in the background and you'll know you have the right one. And we'll put it in the show notes and make sure everybody gets to the right one. Ginger, it has been um, absolutely fantastic to talk to you. Thank you so much um, for telling us about your work, what's going on in neuroscience and letting us know where we can find more more of these exciting updates. I would like to say one other thing. If you go to my website, you will see a link um, on the website for 
free newsletter. And you can get the handout that Deidre talked about, five things you need to know about your brain as a free gift if you sign up. And all that you will get is a monthly newsletter that tells you that the latest episode is out. It's not like one of those drip emails where I'm going to be harassing you. It's just... I hate those. It's just, <laughs> yeah, me too. It's just, it will just tell you when a new show comes out because Brain Science comes out once a month and a lot of people are used to shows that come out more often than that mm, and so they can mm-hmm. forget. So I like to, um, to, to just remind people, hey, it's out there now and this is what it's about. So um, you'll, you'll see a link to that if you just go to brainsciencepodcast.com. Fantastic. Okay, I'm off to do that right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you on the other side. Thanks, Ginger. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. You're still here? Great. Look, I know there's a lot to choose from out there, so thanks for flying with Ambition Incubator Airlines, and I look forward to seeing you on board again soon. Seriously, though, thank you for tuning in. My guests and I love hearing about what inspires you on the show and what advice has made a difference in your life or work and what you'd like more of. So get in touch. If you want to know about my other work, head over to ambitionincubator.com for details. And don't forget to hit subscribe for more great interviews, advice and bite-sized brain science every week. 